Doing good statistical process control requires that your sampling procedure is also understood and well performed. So let's check how to sample for good statistical process control. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And in this video, we'll dive into a bit of Six Sigma and specifically into statistical process controlling. Now, I wanted to do a video on how to chart, especially, you know, the X bar and range charts, uh, how to do the, uh, the real charting and when to put your control levels. But I figured before we talk about that, it's important that we talk about sampling because what you actually want to measure and how your process performs is really important in picking your sample size, your sample period, what to take and also which of the charts afterwards to use. If you do not design your sampling and your control charts in the proper way for your processes, you may actually really be hurting your performance by steering your processes into the wrong way based on data from wrong charts. Now there are quite a number of different charts that you can use. In this video I want to discuss how to choose an IMR chart, an X bar R chart or an X bar S chart and those stand for individual measurement with a moving range. In X bar your result is the average of a number of measurements from a subgroup and then when you have an X bar R a range chart you check the difference between the largest and smallest sample of your subgroup and in an X bar S graph you take the standard deviation between the values within your subgroup. Now the quick and dirty rule how to pick between these charts is if you have no reason to make subgrouping pick the individual with moving range chart. If you have logical subgroups then you pick one of the two X bar graphs and when you then have a small sample size eight or less you take the range when you have a larger than eight sample size you go for the standard deviation within your subgroup. Now that all sounds wonderful and you could have googled the same answer but what does it really mean when you are designing your statistical process control or even getting to know your processes and the results in your products. So let's take a look right I've got these these onions here they come in a nice bag and they promise us a couple of things. So these ones they promise us that one bag is 500 grams and that each of these onions is in class one which is between 30 and 50 millimeters. Right now this should immediately trigger a number of things for you when designing what are we going to measure. So first off apparently there is the weight and the size of the onion and these are of course different measurements but then is it important to know the weight of each onion or not? Probably considering that they promise that the whole net is going to be 500 grams the weight of the individual onion is not that important not as a consumer and therefore also not really as a producer. So let's say that we're in this packaging plant and we've got these onions coming off the line. Is there any reason to assume that two bags that are close to each other are somehow linked in their weight? Probably not. So the weight of a whole bag is an individual measurement. So we're almost certainly going to look for the individual measurements chart. If your factory has a conveyor belt with a check weigher at the end that simply weighs each of these nets of onions as they pass over, you basically have 100% control. First of all, congratulations as the performance excellence manager there because you're going to have an easier time. But also that means that you can plot each of those values, so each weight of a net, into a chart and just follow it and check if it stays between your control lines. If, however, you do not have a check weigher and these nets just are sent into a crate and you have a whole bunch of crates waiting for you somewhere in an expedition area, and you do a little bit of control from time to time. Now we get to a choice between how much control is needed. So when we take out of one of those crates one bag, we weigh it and we do this every half hour or maybe once every crate or once every five crates, then we're still talking about individual data points because they are not linked. They are not really linked in time or in line and there is no reason to subgroup them. But taking only one net from every so many crates may not be enough data for you. So if you design it in such a way that you take, let's say, 10 nets out of every so many crates, then suddenly those 10 nets become a logical subgroup. Because those 10 nets from the same crate are also probably from a same time period on the line, that means the same batch of onions coming in, they have logically 
more link, more connection to each other than different crates. So now we're no longer talking about picking some random data. We have subgrouped our individual data. And in this case, we are looking at one of the X bars or one of the average measurement charts. Now let's look at that other thing that they promised us. Apparently each of these onions is between 30 and 50 millimeters wide. Let's take a simple measuring tape and check. Wow, 45, 35, 30. This might not be the most accurate measuring device and that we need for this one. But you see, we've got some range between 30 and 45 millimeters right here. And now maybe they have it set up in such a way that they scan each onion, but probably not. So you're already feeling here, if we really want to check the size of these onions, then we'll probably do it by taking some samples from time to time and very far from 100% control. Also, you cannot really take these nets apart in line. So here we're almost certain that they will go for a sample size of probably one net, which appears to be 10 onions every time, and just do it at uh, some interval to, to check what is your spread, how are the individual onions forming within one net. And then you get this basic choice, which secondary graph will I use, the range or the standard deviation. As I said, it's common practice to take a range chart when you are dealing with eight or less samples per subgroup or a standard deviation chart when you're dealing with more. Now I've been talking as if you would automatically want two of those charts, right? Both the measurement and the spread between measurements. And this is not as clear cut as many SPC booklets make it out. Now the main chart will be that top chart and most of the control rules really apply to the top chart. Uh, and even in many cases, when you display SPC charts to your operator, you will only display the top one. Now why would you actually like to follow the difference between your measurements? So this range chart that you have at the bottom, because it will also give you a good indication of the stability of your process and it may help you to detect errors in the grouping or in the, uh, in the period of your measurements. Now, what do I mean? Now, if we look again at this net of onions, I have no reason to believe that the weight of this onion will affect the weight of the other onion, especially since they've been harvested long before they were put together in one of these nets. So this idea of the spread within a subgroup will probably be easier to explain with an example from my own profession, the cheese making world. You see many cheese lines, they have a number of columns that are actually making the cheese of one batch. So when we weigh the cheeses after we make them, you get a nice average weight and these columns, they adjust how much cheese they will put into the vat based on the average weight that we get from the resulting cheese. Now, what if one of those columns is overfilling a bit? We will get a higher weight at the end of the line. So all of the columns will start to decrease a bit the amount of cheese that they put into a vat. And the result will be that this one column is overfilling slightly and all the other cheeses will be a little bit too light. So the average weight will be good, but the individual cheeses will all be either too heavy or too light. Now, for this, we can check the spread between the cheeses, and of course we do. So with this cheese line, you either want to measure all cheeses that are coming out, then you can just take the standard deviation or the range between individual cheeses, or you take a subgroup that is the same number as the number of columns, and then you know that you can every time check for the spread between the columns, because this is the logical subgroup based on your process. Now, and another thing that is very important when designing your sampling plan is to check if there are periodic effects. Now within cheese manufacturing, you have a number of these periodic effects that are almost always based on that you're working with batch and continuous processes at the same time. So many other industries will have similar things, but a nice example, for instance, is you brine cheese. So you put it in salty water and we do this in huge cages. We let the cheeses go into a cage, drop it down into this huge swimming pool of salty water. And you can imagine that the cheeses that go in the first are at the bottom of this brining pool. And the cheeses that go in last, they are in the top layers. You would think not really a problem. But then when you're emptying again your brining cages, you start with the top layer. And that actually means 
that the cheeses that went in last come out first. They have had less brining time than the cheeses that went in first and came out last. So as you might imagine, the first cheese of each cage is a little bit more salty than the last cheese of each cage. Now when you're checking the salt content purely for product specifications and regulations, they should all be good. They should all be within the bandwidth. But when you're using these measures to steer your processes, you should be more careful. Because if you take one of the bottom cheeses from one batch and you compare it to one of the top cheeses from another batch and you find that there is a difference in salt content, it may not be a real difference in the process between the batches. It might just be because they were in different places in your brining bath. Now you can either do this at random and accept a bigger spread within your control or you can always take one of those top cheeses and this eliminates part of the spread in your process and allows you to more accurately focus on the difference between batches. And there are many reasons why you might see similar effects within industry. For instance, mixed liquids might be separating a little bit over time or with heat exchanges, for instance, that have a very good transfer of heat when they're completely clean, but the coefficient goes down when there is some sediment on your plates or pipes. So when you're designing your process control, you have to be very mindful about when to sample, how much to sample, and check at what point of your process you're going to do this. And there is not one correct answer for this, right? With that heat exchanger, for instance, you may actually want to follow how that heat transfer coefficient goes down to tell you when you have to clean the machine. While with those brining cheeses, you want to remove the effect between top and bottom in the brining bath when we are comparing between batches, but you want to include it when you want to say something about the whole spread of your system, because both of those cheeses have to be within your legal limits. So let's wrap up what we've been discussing. When we're talking about continuous measurement data, so weight, size, stuff like that, we're basically talking about free charts, which is the individual and moving range chart. Pick this one if you have no reason to subgroup. This is in fact your go-to chart. And when you have clear subgroups, for instance, when your process has a number of different things grouped together. So really your process is making the subgroups. Or when you are really far from doing a 100% control, but you do want to pick a number of samples when you actually do sample so that you have a better representation of your total population, then you are talking about subgroups. And in this case, you pick an X bar chart. So the average of those individual measurements. And then when we have a low number of samples, you pick the range between the highest and the lowest value from your subgroup. When you have a higher than eight number of samples within a subgroup, you use standard deviation. When choosing your sample size and also when you are sampling, be very mindful of periodic effects. The standard thing to look out for is when you're working with batch products, especially if you're moving from batch to continuous, and also if you work in shifts with different operators, be mindful that probably there is a difference between those shifts. So pick subgroups from within one of those shifts. And in fact, when you know that such groupings exist within your process, you should be extra careful with your control graphs and check that you are not accidentally mixing two or three different processes within one control chart. Now we've only scratched the surface of statistical process control. This has all been about continuous data. There are different charts when we're doing pass, no pass type of testing and also we haven't done anything in the charts yet, but since designing your sampling procedure correctly and really choosing what you want to measure is so important for the whole rest of your process control, I thought let's start with that and we'll get to the other topics in other videos. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't done so already, and we'll get into the other parts of statistical process control in future videos. For now, I wish you the best of luck in setting up your sampling plans and as always, Enjoy that journey.